Good evening. Welcome to The Bolt Report. I'm Steve Price filling in again for Andrew. Andrew will be back with you next week. We're going to catch up with Andrew again this half hour. He's in Israel. Yesterday, he was on the Lebanese border. And by the way, that drone strike he described for us last night and showed us pictures of, that was reported widely this morning in uh, the broadsheet newspapers. Andrew will join us tonight from Jerusalem. Now, coming up, it's two years ago today, can you believe it, when the New South Wales town of Lismore was smashed by a once-in-a-lifetime flood event. I think shocked Australia, destroyed thousands of homes. So how has the rebuild gone in Lismore? The Mayor, Steve Krieg, will join us to tell us how that's all going. It's four days now to polling day in Dunkley, with polls suggesting there may even be an upset now, veteran New South Wales Labor figure Michael Costa, he'll talk to about us to, to, as to what a loss might mean for the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. And reports today that ne we, next week's ASEAN conference, I didn't even know it was on in Melbourne, but it's here for three days, we'll see delegates transported in brand new fleet of Commonwealth cars. Now, these things are BMW EVs that will be driven down the Hume Highway from Canberra for the event. These cars cost somewhere between $130,000 and $140,000 each. Plus a housing project, can you believe this, outside Melbourne, with plans for over 300,000 new homes being delayed by threats to a rare lizard. Can you believe that? Uh, you never believe these things. First up, though, tonight, we have to keep calling out climate change hysteria, I think, where we see it without downplaying the seriousness of things like the bushfire situation around the Grampian regions of Melbourne, where dry lightning strikes tonight could still cause fires to ignite. But for the last three days, people in Melbourne have been warned about today, Wednesday, being potentially the worst fire weather conditions since Black Saturday. Well, the Bureau of Meteorology issued again predictions of catastrophic weather, and this, of course, then triggers things like school closures in the regions where it's described as catastrophic. Businesses close, and I know locals out that way complained a few weeks back when it was declared catastrophic and very little happened. Now, the media has to wear some of the blame here for days and days and days in Melbourne, commercial radio, the ABC, plus commercial TV news services have been rattling on about blistering hot weather. V-line trains, that's the country services, they've all been placed on limited running times. But by mid-afternoon in Melbourne, the mercury had struggled into the low to mid-30s. Earlier in the day, just before lunchtime, I had my windscreen wipers on as light drizzle fell and there was zero wind. Now, the wind's up a bit now and we can't predict what might happen in the Grampians. Let's hope everything's OK there. Now, Victoria's not alone with this problem, though. We've seen major forecasting errors from the Bureau around the nation, including massive rain events that were not predicted at all. Interestingly, as I said, I'll talk tonight with Lismore's Steve Krieg about that on the second anniversary of those tragic floods that hit his town. They destroyed 9,000 homes. They had little or no warning of the severity of that flood event. Now, all that brings me to my opinion, in my opinion, an hysterical report carried in the nine newspapers in Sydney and Melbourne today. Now, the Sydney version online was headlined, The Effects of Climate Change on your suburb and city revealed. And you can use your postcode to find out what's going to happen. In the Age newspaper in Melbourne, a more alarming headline, Grim Warnings Over Climate Change Heat. Now, before I explain what this panic merchant piece based its alarmist conclusions on, let me read to you some of the more absurd claims about what the climate will do to various places around Australia. These stories were carried in the nine papers today, if you believe it. Let's go. The Murray-Darling Basin, Shiraz Grapes in the Barossa Valley, the Ningaloo Reef in WA, and even the Australian Open Tennis Tournament, it's claimed in these newspapers, could, wait for it, come under existential threat between now and 2050. Look, I'm not making this stuff up. Those were their predictions. Dry rivers, no Shiraz, a dead reef, and no Australian Open Tennis. It gets worse, if that's possible. Here we go. Melbourne, Sydney, Perth and Canberra can expect twice as many extreme heat days. They call extreme 35 or hotter, even if we meet our existing climate commitments. Now, someone should point out that Melbourne's just had its coldest January for decades. Laughingly, this report, and I can't believe a credible newspaper would run such alarmism, laughingly, 
they predict events out to 2090. 2090. That's 66 years from now. People born today will be on the pension by then. In 2090, it will, according to these predictions, be extremely hot in Darwin nearly every day. Well, isn't it hot in Darwin nearly every day already? OK, so who's making these wild claims? Well, no surprise, the usual suspects. The Climate Council of Australia, headed up by our old mate Tim Flannery, who, of course, famously predicted back in the early 2010s that not even the rain that falls will fill our dams, his exact words. Now, just for Tim's sake, I checked today on his claim. Sydney's Warragamba Dam currently is 98% full and has recently been spilling, so technically it is full. Melbourne's water storages sit at 93.4%. The Goulburn Weir is at 95.88% full and Lake Eildon, 95.78%. So how does Tim and his mates at the Climate Council come up with these grim warnings? Well, faithfully reported, as they were in the nine papers, as I mentioned. Well, just so they can scare the true believers a little more than they made three calculations. They calculated what will happen if globally nations take no action to reduce emissions. What will happen if existing action is maintained? And finally, what will happen if, their words, necessary action is taken? And, of course, a gullible media report what would happen if no action is taken. Well, seriously? Nations, including Australia, have been bullied into taking climate action way beyond what is necessary for decades now. But if you don't have a good old scare campaign every now and then, like predicting our dams will never fill, then you don't have a job, do you? First up, though, joining me tonight, our panel, former New South Wales Labor Treasurer Michael Costa and Director of GXO Strategies Cameron Milner. Now, let's talk to you first, Michael. Uh, I was down in Dunkley on Monday night with Paul Murray for his pub test. Uh, there was a chance for all of the candidates there uh, to take questions uh, from voters on the floor. And the Labor and the Greens candidate, they didn't even bother to show up. Tell by 6.3%. A lot of people I talk to believe it's probably winnable for the coalition. How do you read it? Oh, look, uh, I don't know if it's winnable, but um, certainly I think the real issue here will be the um, swings. Um, I think if the ALP gets a swing of um, less than 2%, I think they'll, they'll be very, very pleased. And if um, if uh, Dutton and the coalition get a swing of around 4%, I think they'll be more than pleased. So it really will come down to the, the uh, swings. I can't see... Labor losing that seat um, for a range of reasons, but um, uh, the, the most important one being, I think, the fact of the circumstances that caused the by-election. I think that's playing on some people's minds, probably enough to um, ensure that the swings aren't uh, large enough for them to lose. Um, but certainly, uh, the ALP will not be happy if they um, if they don't get a swing of less than 2%. Uh, I think that'll put some real pressure on Albo's uh, leadership. And, um, you know, I know he's been out today spinning that, you know, 7.1% is a, a good result in a by-election. He just made that up on the run. I think my figures are closer to what they would be thinking internally. Cameron, uh, not good uh, good for the candidate, the Labor candidate or the Greens candidate not to turn up. I mean, it was a, just an opportunity to sit there, have a yarn, take a few questions. Why wouldn't you do that? Oh, absolutely. And they should have been there with Paul Murray and they should have taken questions from the people in the audience. Um, I mean, that's what politicians are there for, to actually put themselves before the people. So, no, very poor performance, not turning up. I expected the Greens. Pity the Labor candidate didn't do it, though. The uh, PM said today, uh, Cameron, that he won't be in Dunkley on Saturday night. Here's, here's a little of what he said when asked about that. Mm -hmm. At this stage, my plans for Saturday night are to have dinner with my family. Uh, I'll wait and see uh, whether we, we end up uh, going there or, or not, but it's to be uh, in, uh, back in, in, in Sydney because it's my birthday. I doubt he'll turn up to the Mardi Gras, given the flack he got over Taylor Swift and Katy Perry. And it's, it's look, it's his birthday. I think we can probably cut him a fair bit of slack there, can't we? Oh, look, uh, 
Yes and no, Steve. I mean, um, Dunkley is a pretty critical by-election for Labor, and if Labor loses, then it's all down to Albanese. I mean, Jim Chalmers put tax cuts there, the Labor candidate's been really good, but if voters vote against Labor on Saturday, it's because they don't trust Albanese any longer. And they don't trust Albanese because he turns up to Taylor Swift for the free tickets, he turns up to Katy Perry's place at the billionaire's house, and of course he's going to go to the Mardi Gras, because there's not a freebie this guy doesn't walk past. <laughs> Michael, would you uh, advise the PM to go to Mardi Gras on, on Saturday night, given the, 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 the Dunkley by-election and the flack he got for going to those two concerts? I think he'll be sitting at home until it's very clear that he's won that by-election, and then I think you'll see him everywhere. Um, if he hasn't won it, or if the swing is more than 4%, you'll, I think he'll be at home quietly celebrating with the family his birthday. As for the Mardi Gras, I think the heat's gone out of that as a sort of issue uh, since the 2017 referendum. I mean, you know, it's, it doesn't have the same sort of political clout for politicians to turn up. Um, it's almost a dead issue, other than the trans fringe, that are causing all sorts of uh, difficulties for the gay community. Um, I just don't think it's the sort of issue that uh, cuts through anymore. Yeah, I, th I think I, I wonder, though, whether his security detail might be a bit worried, Cameron, about, you know, the pro-Palestinian protesters that are, are turning up at a lot of these rallies and, and inserting themselves into them. I mean, you'd hope the Mardi Gras is not going to be invaded that way, but there's a chance it could happen. And we had... Police down in Melbourne had paint thrown at them when they turned up to march uh, at a gay pride march in St Kilda. So maybe his protection detail might tell him to stay home. Well, I mean, that's the great danger, isn't it? We all tell police they can't turn up in their uniform at a Mardi Gras rally, um, but the Intifada scarf for the Gazans will be there, I'm sure. So mm. um, let's see what happens. But, yes, I mean, these Palestinians crash every event they possibly can, including turning up in front of our opera house and trashing that as well. Yeah, they really are out of control. The police needed to start to do something about the hate speech in regard to that. Michael, when I was at that pub test, uh, we talked a lot about cost of, cost of living and we know that's the big issue. But there were a couple of questions about things like border protection, uh, which I was surprised about. And it was more question, it's questioning around the number of migrants we're bringing into the country, where they're going to live... Uh, and what that's doing to real estate prices in places like Frankston. I, I, I found that really interesting that the, 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 the punters there, very middle-class Australian suburb, were worried about that. That surprise you? Not really. I think it, that's the, the heart of the cost of living, if you look at it. Um, with the sorts of numbers that we're bringing into the country, that's putting pressure on the key asset that... Um, people struggle to purchase in our current environment, that's their own home. And even the rental sub-market is um, also affected. So it doesn't surprise me. What, what it indicates to me, it's really cut through that um, campaign from a range of groups um, about uh, the extraordinary levels of immigration that we're currently having. I think that uh, that uh, is a worrying factor, I think, for the government. Um, people are starting to talk about it if it's coming up in those sorts of uh, focus groups or, or meetings of um, the electorate. Michael, I also think that one of the things that's probably going to happen there on the weekend, and we'll see it unfold on Sky on Saturday night, I think there's going to be, again, another drift to independence. I mean, we saw it with the Teals in that federal election. Uh, there's a, a stack of independents standing in this seat. You imagine that there are going to be quite a lot of people who go, well, a pox on both your houses, I'm going to vote independent. Well, I think that's a rational position, isn't it, at the moment, uh, uh, Steve? You, ca you can't argue that position. I mean, uh, people are looking at both sides and uh, they're not seeing solutions. I mean, it's only, it's only what, uh, 18 months, two years since, um, you know, the coalition was in there and certainly they were at the beginning of all of the uh, cost of living pressures, as we know, and, um, you know, I can understand that position. It's quite a rational position. The issue will be uh, flow of preferences, of course, and um, that may make it tricky for um, for. Dutton, man, perhaps even for Albanese. Still on uh, cost of living, Cameron, some suggestion today that, uh, and the health insurers have, have come out today saying that the government might be delaying decision on how much to increase premiums because of that by-election on the weekend. You'd hope that's not right, wouldn't you? Well, I mean, you know, it, um, you certainly hope that's not the case. If they're trying to hide stuff from voters before they have to actually vote on that on Saturday, that would be a terrible thing. Um, but, no, the cost of living, regardless of the, the uh, rate of inflation, the headline rate of inflation, is still really hurting people. Petrol's up, rents are up, electricity's up, fresh food and vegetables are up. Everyone knows how much more it's costing under Albanese to fill up and to get their groceries each week. Mm.
Michael, can you believe it that uh, a fleet of brand new electric BMWs priced somewhere between 130 and 150,000 bucks uh, are going to head out of Canberra and Adelaide to Melbourne for next week's ASEAN conference so we can chauffeur drive around the, st the city of Melbourne all of the de delegates at ASEAN. Can you believe we've gone out and bought BMW electric vehicles for com cars? Oh, I think it's actually a scandal. And, um, you know, I call these things manufactured explosive devices uh, when my kids are in the car. I mean, you know, I hope one of these things doesn't blow up or, or, or um, runs out of charge on the way or else um, they'll be looking very stupid. But, look, this is consistent with... Um, the government's failure on energy policy. It's all about stunts. It's all about, you know, having a media event rather than dealing with the real problems. And again, feeds into cost of living. If you look at those inflation figures, uh, energy is still an issue uh, for most people and uh, will continue to be whilst Bowen's out there with these mad schemes. Um, and, um, you know, EVs are a joke. Uh, across the board, um, co uh, countries are now walking away from their EV policy, yet Australia is going to mm. showcase a foreign produced EV. Well, it was great to catch up with you both. Michael Costa, Cameron Milner, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Time to check in again with uh, Andrew Bolt. Uh, he is in Israel. He's been bringing us some amazing exclusive footage and information. Now, yesterday, Andrew was at the Lebanese, is Lebanon Israel border. He uh, met with a, a general there, saw firsthand the war with Hezbollah in action. And I can say that the media, Reuters in particular, were reporting this morning in the broadsheet newspapers here in Australia uh, that attack on those two Hezbollah vehicles that Andrew showed us vision of yesterday. Andrew joins us again from, uh, from Israel. What a remarkable scene where I can see you standing, Andrew. Yeah, look, it's important uh, for me to come here, Steve, because I see that the Melbourne Writers' Festival is perpetrating this hoax this fake history that is uh, leading to demonstrations in the street. You've seen the merging of the Aboriginal and Palestinian causes as if they're one. And the, uh, we've now had the vice, uh, the deputy chairman and the head of the Melbourne Writers Festival resign because it's been hijacked. They're pushing the line that Israelis, uh, Jews, are colonists, colonialists in this country, that somehow... Uh, you know, Palestinians were here first and these wicked uh, Jews came and took it all over. Well, this spot where I am now puts the light of that, Stephen. Uh, you will see the Jews first built at this place. I'm at the Western Wall. In this place, 12,000 years ago, the first synagogue, right? Then an army came out of Iraq some 1,600 years ago, uh, 2,500 years ago, sorry, and destroyed it. After 70 years, the Jews were able to come back. They built the second temple, the second temple with the Holy of Holies in it. So that, that this is the closest they could get to uh, the spirit of God. But then the, uh, they were conquered again by the Romans and 70 AD, 70 years after the birth of Christ, it was pulled down, destroyed. The second temple destroyed and the Jews scattered. This is all that remains of that uh, temple, this Western Wall. And you see Jews praying there every day. That's how close they get to the Holy of Holies at the Western Wall. Up the top is a mosque now. Now, that was built. <laughs> that was built just after the invention of Islam. We we're talking about uh, 700 AD, after the birth of Christ. This tells you Islam came after the Jews. That's, that's the old bit there. The idea that Jews are colonists, colonialists in this country, uh, displacing Muslims is, is put to the lie right here. And I just can't believe that the Melbourne Writers' Festival, is supposed to be intellectuals, you know, we know about the truth and all that, could, could say something so stupid as to make Jews seem like newcomers to this land where they've been for 12 years thousand years an incredible uh, illustration of living history andrew it's just you know, i mean I, I you can feel even from where i am this distance away how, how important that place is and you know i really appreciate the fact you've made the the effort to go there 
I want to. Uh, I don't want to upset you again. I don't want to make you angry. I, I know that you're <laughs> you're there. You know, wit, wit, witnessing history. But I want to play you a clip from your mates at the ABC this morning. One of Victoria's most prominent is prominent Islamic leaders, who was labelling Hamas's October 7 massacre as quote a legitimate act of resistance by the Palestinian people. Have a have a listen and a look at this. It is absolutely legitimate for the Palestinians to try to break the siege of Gaza. No, I'm talking about October the 7th. As I said, I'm not going to condemn the Palestinians for resisting. I'm not going to condemn the Palestinians for trying to break their siege on their territory. Uh, so, Sorry, I, I just want to be clear. October the 7th, yeah. you're saying you won't denounce that? I denounce any violence against civilians. That is clear. 1,200 people we died. All uh, we denounce, I mean, very clear, Patricia, we denounce any violence and killing of civilians, but we, what we don't denounce very clearly is legitimate act of resistance. And for the Palestinians to rise up on October the 7th and say, we're no longer going to tolerate this siege, this occupation, that's legitimate. Now, if they've, they've done things, if they've done things that is against international law, then they should be held to account for that. that I, I don't think we can be any clearer than that. But they, they but have a do right you to Honestly, resist. I don't mean to be rude and interrupt, but are you honestly saying that the October 7 event was the Palestinians rising up? It was, it was a terror attack, wasn't it? Well, that's the way it's been, that's the way it's been categorised. Well, that's Adele Salmon, Hi. Andrew, um, and he used the word legitimate there. You're there on the ground. You've been to these killing spots where this terror attack took place. How angry does that make you feel? And, and imagine if you played that to the people you've met this week. I'm just staggered the inhumanity of a man like that. And unfortunately, he's the leader of the Islamic Council of Victoria. Can you imagine what's being discuss the mosques and all that, if that's an example. Mate, it's not just the people I've talked to, it's the video I've seen. I want to ask him, is it, was it legitimate for 3,500 Hamas terrorists to go on a killing spree, going house to house, shooting dead old people, young people, babies? Is that legitimate? Was it legitimate to rape women and to kill them after raping them? A footage I saw of a woman who'd been raped so badly, there was blood... So, apologies for being graphic, but you have to be. Raped so badly, you could see in the film that Hamas took themselves blood soaking her crotch. Is that a legitimate act of resistance? I want to ask this man, which particular acts here does he think were legitimate? The killing of babies, burning of bodies, shooting of civilians, uh, raping of women massacring of women, exactly what? I talked to the head last night of the group set up to help the hostage families and the hostages. And he tells me there are still about uh, 15 women hostages kept in Gaza. The reason they have not been released so far, he doesn't want to say so publicly, specifically, they're a family here. But the, let me say it. A number would have been raped, and Hamas doesn't want to let them go to tell the, let them tell their truth to the world. Which bit of this does this man? A, a, a man is flattering him, almost an animal, I would say. This man, which bit of all that does he think is legitimate? And you wonder, you know, how he gets away going on the ABC and saying that. I mean, to a credit, I guess. Patricia Cavallis tried to pull him up. Let's go back to the situation today. There are reports that Iran and Hamas are planning to use Ramadan next month to, quote, create another October 7 attack. Have you heard anything about this? What, what intelligence are you hearing about where, what might happen next in the region where you are? Well, this is, again, a really important site from that point of view. Um, this, the mosque up there, you might see just a tiny bit of gold poking up a little corner there, around there. That's the third holiest site in Islam, right? So the, uh, the Muslims came here, they saw it was a holy site, they thought they'd put their mosque up there, supposedly where Muhammad went to, to heaven from this spot. And Ramadan is very important. A lot of uh, Muslims here, they come here to pray, and the Israeli government is terrified of what might happen because... There's been times they've thrown rocks down there, the worship is here, 
and it's just, you know, tensions get very high. Muslims don't eat during the day in Ramadan. And they've been trying to think, who do we limit? Do we limit people from outside Jerusalem, Muslims to come here? Do we limit young men to come here? A big debate about that. And uh, so this could be one of the big flashpoints. Because when this happens, oh, Muslims around the Middle East say, oh, Al-Aqsa, this is Al-Aqsa. Is it a threat? We've got to rise to defend it. And uh, that is the big issue for Israel. Extraordinary stuff, Andrew. Extraordinary scenes uh, that you've brought to us tonight. Thanks a lot. Look after yourself. We'll talk tomorrow. A pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Great access there with Andrew. Now, after the break, it's been two years, can you believe it, since the northern New South Wales town of Lismore was smashed by a once-in-a-generation flood event, destroyed 4,000 properties and forever changed the way that people live in that community. I'm very interested to see how the recovery promises that were made, and I covered this extensively on the radio two years ago, have those promises been met? I'll talk to the Lismore Mayor after this. Welcome back. Steve Price in for Andrew Bolt. We'll have a bit more to say about that crazy purchase of electric vehicles, electric Commonwealth cars to drive politicians around coming up between now and the top of the hour. Now, this day two years ago, uh, a crisis was unfolding in the northern New South Wales community of Lismore. Uh, that's right up, as uh, most of us now know, by the New South Wales Queensland border. Have a listen to these numbers, though. Uh, 670 millimetres of rain fell over a period of two days. Now, that caused the waterways around Lismore to rise by up to 11 metres. Now, by Monday morning, that, so that was February 28, 2022, floodwaters were at the highest level ever recorded in Lismore. They reached 14.4 metres. Uh, there were 4,000 homes damaged beyond repair, uninhabitable. And another 10,848 properties were damaged. Five lives were lost. Now, joining us now is someone I spoke to almost on a daily basis during that emergency on the radio, Lismore Mayor Steve Krieg. Great to see you again, my friend. I've got to ask you straight up, though, what were you doing at this time two years ago? Oh, Pricey, uh, I was finishing packing up my own home and business, thinking that we were well prepared. I, I actually went through the CBD and helped a few mates with their businesses as well. Uh, you know, the flood warnings at this time last year were that we'd get to about 11 metres, which is still below our levee height. Uh, myself uh, assumed, you know, that the this was a, a practice run, to be honest with you. We were doing um, a trial run for if, if and when we ever had to pack up, if, if the levee ever got breached again. They were the warnings coming out of the Bureau. They were the warnings coming out of the SES at this time, exact time two years ago um but yeah we all know it turned south pretty quickly at around two o'clock in the morning on the on the monday morning and by that monday morning and um, we were watching weren't we pictures of you know those brave volunteers who got their their uh, jet skis out they got out their rubber duckies they got out their tinnies they, they were rescuing people off the roofs of houses we had you know, local politicians swimming, getting caught up in the floodwaters and being rescued from trees. I mean, it was just a downpour like we'd never seen and a rescue effort that the locals saved themselves. You know, I mean, you, you didn't have the, the rescue uh, equipment around the area to do it, did you? No, that's right, Pricey. You, you know, it was something like an apocalypse and, and the very place I'm sitting now at the Lismore Showgrounds was a safe haven for our city. Uh, this was the place that animals and people could bring some uh, some of their goods and like caravans and stuff. Like this time two years ago, even this place is a safe haven was five metres underwater. Uh, it was absolute devastation like we have never seen or experienced before in 160 years of, of white settlement in, in the northern rivers of New South Wales. And hopefully... Uh, you know, I'm 52 years old. I'll never see it in my lifetime or my children's lifetime. I'm going to get on to promises made and broken in a second. And I know, you, I know you'll give me the, the truth about that uh, and the damage that was done and the number of houses that were bowled over. Uh, just a personal question. Did you ever think about leaving? Uh, 
to be honest, yes. I, you know, I'm. I was born and raised in in WA. My parents still live over in the west, and I've still got uh, strong ties uh, to the great state of Western Australia. Probably become its own country soon if they get their own way over there, mad buggers. Uh, but you know that sort of stuff goes through your mind. You got to like for me, Pricey. I literally lost everything. Uh, my my family uh, things that you sort of collect over time. I've got five kids. You collect their first little booties. Your your christening certificate. All of these sorts of things that you sort of don't pay much attention to until they're gone. Uh, you know, at the height of the disaster, um, you sort of think, I can never recover from this. I can never bounce back. Uh, you know, at that time, you spend your whole life working towards owning your own house and running your business and looking after your children and making sure that your family's safe. And at that time, you it's probably the most vulnerable I've ever felt as a father and as a husband and as a business owner and and a newly elected mayor I was, I was uh put in my position six weeks before the flood hit and there was a real sense of of responsibility to my community I love the people that that call the Northern Rivers and Lismore home I I really do we don't always get along but I, I can walk down the street of Lismore with my head held high and, and know that, you know, regardless of any belief structures or systems, uh, you can say good day and have a chat and you all get along. And that's what I love about living in this region is the people. Uh, makes it really special. And But, yeah, when you, when you literally lose everything except the clothes on your back, it does make you question whether you want to stay. Yeah, you were so solid through that and you were just such a champion. Now, once the floodwaters left, the flood of politicians started. They came from both sides of the border. They came from Canberra, came from Sydney, and they uh, made a lot of promises about uh, making sure that Lismore could be rebuilt. They talked about emergency housing. They talked about looking after the businesses in the community. Now, how many people are back into the, the houses that were... Uh, were were savable, and how many people are still living in temporary accommodation two years later? Oh, Pricey, I'm going to be the first to admit that we've made mistakes, and by we, I'm talking local, state and federal government uh, politicians and and bureaucrats, more to the point. I, I, I still believe wholeheartedly that the politicians' intentions were and are good. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll stand behind that. I think, you know, the promises that really cut deep with me are the the promises of cutting red tape to be able to fast track uh, the removal of houses off the floodplain, the, the promises of, of infrastructure works, you know, and I'll, I'll cite the example which will make you probably smile and cry at the same time, Pricey, you know. We had the Premier up here two weeks ago announcing 400 new residential lots for the city of Lismore uh, to help with the housing crisis, to, to give people who were so flood affected a place to go that is flood free. And that's a great announcement for the city, don't get me wrong. Now, early on in the days, we got a $146 million infrastructure announcement, 110 million of that for Lismore to rebuild our sewage treatment plant. Now. Poo is not sexy, but it is critical to the running of a, a city like, or a town or wherever you live. Um, you know, two years on to the day, that $110 million that w was promised to rebuild our sewage treatment plan, our pump stations, all of those things that have been running on life support for two years now to get uh, people's sewage and, and wastewater away, uh, still hasn't come through. The announcement made of 400 homes, they're, they're saying will be two years in the making. If we get that money as a council tomorrow, it's a three-year rebuild of our sewage treatment plan. So we can have 400 houses or house lots, sorry, ready to be built on by 2026. But because the money has been so slow coming to rebuild our major and core infrastructure projects, they won't be able to be lived on for another year or maybe two years after that so the frustration for me is these promises that get rolled out 
the length of time for that money to actually get delivered to the organisation that can actually get involved and get hands on. We're resourced up. We're ready to go as a council. We just need the state and federal governments to back us, to sign these uh, funding deeds and let us get on with the job to rebuild our city. Let's keep talking. We'll catch up soon. Steve Craig, thanks for your time. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. You've done a wonderful job there. Now, coming up after the break, New South Wales Police Commissioner Karen Webb, she seems to be in a constant battle with the Sydney media for some reason. Sophie Ellsworth, the Australian's media writer, she'll join me next. Steve Price in for Andrew Bolt, who is in Israel. We'll talk to Andrew again tomorrow night. Now, the New South Wales Police Commissioner, I find this fascinating. She continues to come under fire for her disastrous media appearances. Now, there's been a number of them. Uh, the most recent followed the tragic murders of Jesse Baird and Luke Davies. Now, the Commissioner was forced to back down after saying she was grateful, her words, uh, for the to the accused for information that led to the police discovering the bodies of those victims. Here's, here's her and what she had to say. Well, certainly I'm not perfect and I could always do things better, but the comment around grateful for the information, I'm not necessarily grateful to the accused, but let me just put it this way. Without that information, we were still searching. It's not the only problem she's had with the media. I mean, uh, she was discovered last year having uh, going on holidays during Police Remembrance Day, uh, and she's made another uh, a number of other stumbles. Joining me now, the Australian's media writer, Sophie Ellsworth. I just wonder who's giving that police commissioner media advice. Uh, Steve, this is really bad uh, media performances and consecutively bad media performances by the Commissioner. Now, yes, she's under a lot of pressure at the moment. This story with the two young men uh, and the alleged murderer who's a police officer, shocking. But she has to be a good speaker on her feet. And she, the other day she was quoting Taylor Swift, for heaven's sake, in something as serious as an alleged double murder. And I just wonder, Steve, who are the people behind her giving her this advice to even think in a case of a double murder that you'd bring da Taylor Swift into it. And she seems to be sort of having to apologise for what she's saying. I mean, to be grateful for the advice from an alleged murderer is really concerning to the public. And she's been called out on this. Yeah, she has been. I mean, I, I might play the devil's advocate slightly. I mean, the job of the police commission is a hard job. And I don't think we've got particularly great police commissioners around the country. The Queensland Police Commissioner, she's quit five months before her contract was up. I don't think Shane Patton, the, the Victorian Police Commissioner, is doing a particularly good job. He ended up marching in a gay pride march down in St Kilda and had paint thrown all over him. Uh, he then had to go on and explain what that was all about. Why don't these commissioners hire somebody to be their, their media person, their upfront person, to speak to the media in these media conferences? So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sworn police officer. Someone who was a, an ex-reporter who is used to dealing with reporters and looking at cameras and do that job and let the commissioner get on with... I'd rather they be out there hunting down... You know, 17 year olds who are breaking into houses and stealing cars, to be honest. Well, fair enough, Steve, but she's getting in front of the cameras. Shane Patton is in the media repeatedly. These are commissioners, the top dogs, the top police officer in the state. They are going and fronting the media and they need to be well trained. And it appears in the situation of the New South Wales Police Commissioner, she's not because she's making error after error. She just needs to work on her lines and realise what she's saying. You don't bring in pop stars when you're talking about a double murder. No, I mean, that was pathetic. But you had Woolworths CEO Brad Banducci, we had last week, of course. I mean, he, that was Terrible. just a train wreck walking out of that ABC interview. And as he walked off camera, the media advisor tried to push him back in front of the camera. He's retired. He doesn't care, probably, because he's got a multi-million dollar payout. But... These people need better media training, clearly. But, Steve, they're not new kids on the block. No. Brad Banducci has been the Woolies CEO for eight-odd years. He's not a newbie to this. No, they not. know how to rehearse their lines. He got hot under the collar and he handled it atrociously. And I say if they're going to get these big salaries, they need to be able to uh, perform under the heat. And he couldn't. When he got a bit under the collar, he got aggravated, he walked off. And then he's saying, oh, cut that out. I mean, this 
this is just journalists just rubbing their hands with glee going, he's just giving me a scoop here. This is marvellous. Oh, and they knew he was going to be gone the next day. Now, if there's anyone who knows about a stunt, uh, it's the next pair we're going to talk about. Uh, this is the Kiss FM's Kyle and Jackie O show. I've had a few run-ins with Kyle over the time. Kyle, was it the other day that I said something about Kyle and he rang me up in the morning and left a filthy message on my voicemail? abusing me. Anyway, Jackie O, who's the, the girl who does the show with him, very mm. successful. They're both mm. paid, I think, $10 million each to do their radio show. She stormed out of the studio after learning that the station that employs them, KISS FM, has the highest gender pay gap disparity across a, not only Australian radio but all the media. She stormed out to be with female staff. Real or a stunt? Oh, come on, Steve. Now, how long have no, you been know. in there? Oh, real come on, Steve. Uh, I think you I'm know. you real. Look, you're not a newbie, newbie here. I don't think that was real. And this is the thing. Let's let's give them kudos. Jackie and Kyle and Jackie O are the top rating Brisbane. Uh, sorry, Sydney breakfast radio program. Soon Whatever they Melbourne. do works. They're soon to come to Melbourne. Maybe. Uh, this makes headlines. You see all the media pick it up. Uh, no one cares really if it's true or not. They just pick it up. So they're getting the publicity they want, but um, I'm not so sure Have a guess it's who in the media, in which media companies uh, were the best when it came to uh, gender pay gap? Sky fact, News Australia. In fact, the women at Sky mm -hmm. paid more than the men. Yeah, and I saw that the uh, uh, I saw that Crikey wrote about that. It must have been hard for them that to write about that. That doesn't surprise me at all. I got to say, uh, the ABC now they've really loved putting their foot in it. They went on this huge hiring spree. I'm told uh, you've written this story, uh, hiring a whole bunch of cultural advisors to make sure that their producers on radio, TV, journalists were all dealing with quote culturally sensitive stories. Well. Imagine the shock on their faces when last week the ABC published a story online about smoking stereotypes. Now, this is just one of the opening lines of the report. If you were asked to picture a typical smoker, Sophie, you might come up with the following stereotypes. Someone who is unemployed, uneducated, Indigenous and suffering poor mental health. Well, as you can imagine, that did not go down all that well. The line was quickly altered to, and removed any reference to Indigenous people and changed to, if you were asked to picture a typical smoker, you might not imagine someone unemployed, educated or has good mental health. What's the cultural, cultural ambassador doing? Well, they've got these new through. cultural guidance advisors that they've hired. There's going to be three of them. They've hired one. They've got another two coming in. And they've got to make sure, Steve, that stories are culturally sensitive. Of course. So I'm surprised this actually got through. But someone in the ABC went, this is shocking. They stripped it down. They rewrote the entire story. Tried to make out it never happened. Make out it never happened. <laughs> they put a little disclaimer at the bottom. And they didn't put on their corrections page until we ran a story in the Australian saying, why isn't this on the ABC's correction page? And sure enough, it suddenly arrived on the corrections page. I love the way you keep the ABC honest, Sophie. Thank you very much. Sophie Ellsworth, thank you very much for your time. Now, after the break, Labor's latest attempt at spruiking its own policies and another example of the woke agenda infiltrating our Defence Force. Welcome back, Steve Price in for Andrew Boat. Now, I'll catch up with my panel shortly and talk about Labor's electric vehicle own goal. But first, here is a look at what's coming up next on Shari. Thanks, Steve. Well, coming up on the show tonight, I've got new information about the Melbourne woman accused of kidnapping and torture. There were multiple warnings to police about her behaviour, plus Labor resorts to smearing Sky News instead of answering tough questions about giving visas to Palestinians. I'll see you at 8. Good on you, Shari. Thank you very much for that. Joining me now is Sky News contributor Evelyn Ray and Deputy Executive Director of the Institute for Public Affairs, Daniel Wild. Great to see you both. Uh, Daniel, can I start with you? Uh, I couldn't believe it when I read this today. Uh, Labor's trying to push electric vehicles on all of us and, uh, you know, Chris Bowen is completely obsessed with electric vehicles. He's up there in question time again today trying to answer questions about how, you know, utes are not going to cost more money when new fuel policies are, are bought in. But the Commonwealth's gone out and purchased uh, expensive BMWs, BMW electric vehicles, uh, priced between 150 and 
130, $150,000. They're all in Canberra and Adelaide to, you know, drive pollies around. ASEAN's on in Melbourne next week. They've instructed the Commonwealth drivers uh, to drive down the Hume Highway and across from Adelaide in these BMW iX SUVs uh, to ferry all the delegates at ASEAN around Melbourne. And they're, they're pouring over maps, Daniel, to work out where the charging stations are. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know whether they're going to make the journey, Steve, to be honest with you. But, you know, I, I think it is just another example of how out of touch Australia's political class are. I mean, why they're driving around in $150,000 cars. Of course, you've got Australians doing it tough with the cost of living. And Chris Bowen's answers to these simple questions just don't stack up. Of course, if you're going to put more regulation and effectively a tax on utility vehicles and SUVs and petrol and diesel vehicles, they're going to go up in price. And it's just another example of the day-to-day -day consequences of net zero. This is what it looks like in action. It's real, tangible consequences to the lives of mainstream Australians, whether it's the electrification and cutting off gas in Victoria, whether it's the farmlands being covered in wind turbines and solar panels, or whether it's uh, the increase in the cost of your basic amenities and your vehicles. This is what life will look like under net zero. And unfortunately, it's only going to get worse until we stop the rollout of renewables and get in baseload power. Evelyn, I know a little bit about cars and I'm going to talk on the program tomorrow night to an expert who actually did a, a, an experiment driving an electric car from Melbourne to Sydney and a petrol car from Melbourne to Sydney, exactly the same models, and it took about three times as long for the electric vehicle to get there. Why... If, I mean, we're the taxpayers. If they're going to go and buy new cars for the com car fleet and they want them to be electric, you can buy a cheap MG electric car or a, a one, one made in Korea. Uh, the politician's so precious that they don't want to sit in the back of an MG. Look, it's, it's all part of their virtue signal, but unfortunately they've missed the boat with this one with their fancy schmancy BMW cars. Next it'll be a Lamborghini EV or a Ferrari, who knows, but they'll have an excuse and they'll try and make it happen for them. But they can't give up on the idea of EVs because giving up on the idea would breach their apostasy laws. And until we all collectively say no, they're going to continue to live in their delusion and force us to live in it with them. That study that you you mentioned not only did it take them 25% extra to travel from Sydney to Melbourne in an electric car, it also cost them more. It was $140 for petrol and it was $210 to charge the thing. So it's going to cost Australians more. And right now, Australians don't want to hear it and they're not going to buy it. You know what is going to save the planet? Not EV cars, but what will save or is a good step in saving the planet is mocking these fools into silence who are trying to force us into this dystopian nightmare. Daniel, I think, well said, Evelyn. Daniel, I think one of the stories of the week is going to be that Queensland Supreme Court ruling that COVID vaccine mandates were unlawful. There are predictions other states with similar cases are going to fall into line. I think Victoria will be one as well. It's also increased calls for a Royal Commission into vaccine mandates. When you think back on it now, how crazy was it to mandate people, particularly who were in industries where you desperately needed workers during COVID and told them they couldn't work unless they had three injections? Well, that's right, Steve. I mean, as the days and the weeks and the months go by, we look back on COVID and see that almost every single aspect of it, the lockdowns, the keeping children out of school, the social distancing, the mandates, they constituted the single biggest peacetime public policy failure in Australia history. And Australians deserve nothing less than a full and transparent and all-encompassing Royal Commission into all aspects of the COVID handling, including the mandate. So far, all of the political leaders and the health bureaucrats and the main organs of civil society that push these policies onto Australians have gotten away scot-free. Uh, and we need to make sure that this uh, never happens again. The other issue, Steve, was the rampant censorship that took place throughout the entire COVID period. We need to make sure that as a society, Australians can voice their views, even if they're unpopular at the time, because as the days goes by, those who are raising objections and legitimate questions have been proven right. Evelyn, we've got a uh, building project down in Melbourne in Victoria. It's been held up by a lizard that thought to be distinct and now the planning rules won't allow 300,000 homes to be built. Can you believe that? 
Look, I can believe it. I've seen, I've had it personally in my life with a family member. They weren't able to build their home because they thought they found a seashell in the country. So they had, it doesn't surprise me, but look, I never thought in my wildest dreams, I would be on the side of halting developments, but have you seen that lizard, how cute it is? I mean, maybe it's a woman thing. I think it's adorable, <laughs> but you know, it is a living thing. I think that I, I'm all for this right wing environmentalism, which is let's try and preserve life. Yeah. It's a life, but let's well, do it reasonably and timely. Yeah, let's move the lizard would be my view, but uh, you're yes. quite right, it is pretty <laughs> cute. Evelyn Ray and Daniel Wilder, thank you very much for your time tonight. Lizards and housing development, can you believe it? That's it from me. Coming up now, Shari Marks. And Shari, you've got new details, I think, about a Melbourne woman accused of kidnapping and torture. Steve, that's right. I've got new first-hand information about this accused woman that police and ASIO were repeatedly warned about her. I'm going to bring all of that to you in a minute. I'm also going to speak about how this woman's social media posts resulted in one of her followers sending me death threats. I've, I've never spoken about that before. This woman now accused of alleged kidnap and torture of a man because he works for a Jewish employer.